we'll just give it a couple more minutes. We're still a little bit early. Um, but thank you to everyone who's already joined us. Um, we appreciate it. These lectures have been a really great way to stay connected to everyone. Um, so they've been very, very good for us. I hope they've been entertaining for all of you as well. And uh, just again, I see we've got some new people who've just signed on. Um, Susan, we'll get started in just a couple minutes. We'll, we'll give We'll give a two minute grace period, we'll call it. We'll start at 12.32. Um, if you have any questions, you can put those in the chat box, uh, which you can find at the bottom of your screen or also the question and answer, I'll monitor both. We'll wait and hold questions until the end, but feel free to put your questions in as you have them. You don't have to wait and remember them until the very end. Um, and uh, if you want to minimize my video, uh, Susan's video, if they're for some reason in the way of you seeing the images, um, at the top of your video box, there should be three icons. The little minus sign will just eliminate the videos um, and you can tap it again to get them back. Um, the single box will just show Susan as she is speaking. Um, and the uh, two rectangles, one on top of the other, will show all of us. So up to you to choose your own adventure of what you'd like to see there. We'll give it just a couple more minutes for folks. I see a lot signing in now. Um, I apologize to those of you who called in early for having to hear my, uh, my spiel a few times, um, but we're all still getting familiar with this new way of meeting. So I like to make sure everyone knows how to use all of our functions. Um, Again, thank you to everyone who's signing in. Um, we will take questions as you at the end of Susan's lecture, but if you have them, um, you can go ahead and chat them over to me um, in the webinar chat, or you can use the question and answer function. Both of those should be visible at the bottom of your screen if you're on a laptop. Uh, if you're on a mobile device, you'll want to look for the uh, I call it an ellipses. I don't think that's what it really is, but the three dots uh, and those three dots will take you to where the chat and the question and answer are available. I'll give it just another minute, but I think we've got most everyone. Um, thank you all again uh, for signing in. We do appreciate it. We, we put these on. We hope people enjoy them. They are, they've been a great lifeline for us and a great way to keep everyone connected to the park. Um, I'm sure some of you have been able to go. Um, some of us live further away and haven't been in a while. So this is a nice look in. And uh, Susan, I'm going to go dark and hand it off to you. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be joining you all today to talk about the beautiful blooms in Washington Square Park. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with the Conservancy on a couple of bloom guides um, that kind of approached just little blurbs about things that are blooming seasonally in the park. So it's great that we can talk about this today because we're frequently working on those bloom guides well before the flowers we're writing about are actually blooming. So a lot of the plants I'm going to talk about today we wrote about back in December. And as Grace mentioned earlier, I was able to get to the park last week for the first time since um, March. So it was really wonderful to see everything in bloom. Um, since I haven't done any of the planning or planting that's in the park, um, I'm going to be raving about, you know, cer certain particular plants or schemes, and I'm not complimenting myself. Um, but since I have kind of experienced the joys and challenges of urban gardening in public spaces, I can really just appreciate how much work um, has gone into the plantings and how they've really evolved over the last several years with the investment of staff and volunteers and donors. Um, I am going to ask for your patience um, as we chat. Um, I um, am used to kind of talking and being able to gesture at things and talk with my hands. So I'm going to try to do my best. I'm operating with two screens. So you should be seeing some nice large images. Um, but 
as Grace mentioned, there's a Q&A. So absolutely, um, at the end, if there's an image that you want to go back to, to spend a little more time with, just let me know. Um, and so on this map, this wonderful map of the park, I've um, chosen six plants that are scattered across the park. Some are beginning to fade, some are in full bloom, full glorious bloom, and some are just getting ready. These are all perennials for the most part, meaning they come back every year. And there are a couple that are evergreen plants, meaning they retain their foliage year round. Um, I've included the botanical names and the common names, and I'll be very honest that I'm completely inconsistent when talking about plants. I tend to default to the name used when I was first introduced to a plant and how I've come to work with it over the years of gardening. And I also don't want not knowing or perhaps not being able to pronounce the botanical name to stop people from being able to enjoy talking about plants and that's part of the goal of the the guides that we've done for the conservancy too is to get people to kind of be familiar with the plants um, so as you can see i've on this map pointed out six that we're going to kind of talk about in different corners of the park a lot of them are actually scattered in several places um, i've taken photographs of what they looked like last week so you can kind of see the most up-to-date info and we are kind of starting with a wow. Um, and this is the foxtail lily. And these are planted. So this picture is um, looking towards the fountain, looking west. And these um, lilies are planted in the parterre or formal beds. So they're the beds that are surrounded by the box, um, boxwood, the hedges, on either side of the fountain. And these are um, relatively new in the park and they really make a statement. They, in this particular view, they're that wonderful, foxtail is very descriptive, That's that um, tall slender stem with the tail of plumes at the top that really wave kind of delightfully in these beds and really make a statement. And um, some of them are starting to fade, but there's still quite a few blooms when I was there this week. This particular um, foxtail li lily is Cleopatra. There are a few different color varieties available, but I love this choice that was made because it's peach and yellow and they really kind of glow like sunshine and it's easy to spot them from across the park. I've included just the little um, blurb that we have um, from the plant guide um, as well as a notation for each plant what they kind of attract because most of the um, flowers that we're going to look at today are pollinator friendly, meaning they attract insects or animals that fertilize the plants and the plants in turn provide food and a habitat. In New York, this is particularly for bees and butterflies. So you can see here on the foxtail lily, a uh, bee busy. They were very busy when I was there last week. And it gives you a closer perspective on the individual little blossoms that make up that wonderful foxtail. Um, next up is Nepeta, and I don't know for our audience how many of you may be gardeners, how many of you really know your plants, or how many of you don't know them at all. So I'm going to just assume that we're all becoming familiar with plants. And if you don't know Nepeta, um, this is when once you know it, you're suddenly going to see it everywhere. And you're going to realize that all those waving purple wands that you see throughout the city that you thought were lavender are actually nepeta. This is a view kind of looking towards the fountain, again looking west, and you see these purple waves in the foreground of the image and in the background, and that is all nepeta. And it's probably the plants that I most frequently have to explain to people. I think actually when I was at the park last week, I overheard someone saying, oh, look at all this fabulous lavender. And I wish that through Zoom, we had the ability to share smell because if you aren't familiar with Nepeta, you just need to be near it and smell it. And then the cat mint common name of it makes sense. It has this very distinctive minty smell. Um, so it's not in the lavender family, but in the mint family. And the reason that you see it in so many urban gardens is that it's tough. 
It doesn't mind poor soil. It can cling to an embankment or settle into a bed. The blooms are long lasting. So it's been blooming for a little bit in the park and it will continue to bloom during the summer. Um, they are an amazing bee attractor. So if you're not able to get to Washington Square Park, but you have some little spot of green near you that has napeta, I encourage you kind of at this time of year to just really stand still and wait. And if you look closely, it's just going to be a mass of buzzing bees. In Washington Square Park, um, this is located in several areas kind of surrounding the fountain by the arch and frequently mixed with roses. So you see this wonderful um, mix of color and shape in the garden. Next up, I've included Porovskia or Russian sage because it's a fabulous bloomer, but also one that's mistake, mistaken for lavender frequently. Right now, it's not quite blooming in the park. So in this picture, and I'm standing, standing kind of on Washington Square Park South at the entrance to the Chess Plaza, so along the fence line, and you can see it in the bottom kind of middle of the image, and it grows much more true and straight than Nepeta, and it blooms a little bit later. And here you can see it um, just kind of starting to bud last week, and again, here's where smell would help. You can just smell that sage scent when you get close. It always makes me very hungry when I smell the Russian sage. Um, and you can also see the, the leaves are much more slender than those of the nepeta, which has a really clear mint kind of uh, leaf. And you know, at first I was disappointed that I didn't have a chance to show it to you in bloom. And also that when I looked through park images, I couldn't actually find one of it in full bloom in my own images, so I need to get that this summer. But I decided that this image, kind of at the entrance to the chess plaza, with its kind of wonderful jumble of flowers, kind of illustrates what is going on in many of the beds. There are layers of plants, repetition of color and height over the seasons to provide this really long layered bloom time for human visitors and also the bees, the butterflies, the birds, the other unseen creatures that make the park their home or the resting stop. And these beds have really just filled out wonderfully in the last couple of years. And in this image, you can see the Porovskia, the Russian sage, kind of standing tall right back, particularly in the back left of the image. So hopefully in a couple of weeks, this will be in full bloom. And I don't know if any of you had a chance to do the wonderful walkthrough with the Amazing Ghee last, I think it was last month, towards the end of May. And he talked about his concept of planting in drifts throughout the park. And the use of a stilby really illustrates, I think, what he was talking about. And the astilbe is just really beautiful right now. So in this image, it's that wonderful sea of light and bright pink that you're seeing in the center with some um, allium shoots kind of coming out. Those have been done blooming, um, but you can still see their husks there. Um, these flowers, the astilbe, have plumes of fluffy little white, little white and pink flowers that are lovely on their own, but a single one doesn't really make, uh, it can be a bit lost in the landscape. But group them all together, like he was talking, here we're by the arch looking towards the fountain, and they make a much bigger impact. So there are lots of varieties of a still be in the park um, from white to dark pink, but one we focused on the planting guide is a bit more unusual, Chocolate Shogun, and you can find it in the shady corner beds at the entrances, particularly at the southeast and southwest corners, and compared to some of the other varieties, um, 
it has much darker leaves. In this image, you can hopefully see these kind of chocolatey, really dark glistening leaves that stand out even amidst the kind of brighter, large greens of the other plantings. And they really love a shady spot, hence the planting in these corner beds. When I was there last week, they weren't quite in full bloom. So that's the image you see on your left. And maybe that gives you a sense of these tiny little fluffy blossoms that are going to be coming out of all those little spots. On the right is an image that a volunteer took last year when it was in bloom. Um, so you can see those um, dark leaves have really grown in size and you can see the, the pink blooms kind of still even standing out even though they're not masked in this um, bed. Their funky shape kind of stands out. The Echinacea or coneflower is a summer bloomer that probably for most people is recognizable because of its almost kind of daisy-like appearance. And it wasn't one that I was originally planning to include. But when I visited last week, suddenly I saw one, I thought, oh my word, one is blooming, hiding. And then suddenly I started to see more and more um, in the park, um, looking just really lovely. It is a native. It's loved by bees and butterflies. It naturalizes, meaning it spreads on its own and it has really long lasting blooms. So because of its height, it's a bright color um, and it's um, long lasting blooms, you're going to see it mixed in many of the beds. Um, on the left top, you can see it's not that particular sample is not quite yet in bloom, but you can see it with in a bed with the nepeta. And at the bottom, one that has bloomed. And this variety has the wonderful purpley pink color. Um, and in the summer, you'll be able to see tons of butterflies. Hopefully, we'll all be back to see those um, in the park. Um, and while we've looked at some beautiful blooming standouts for the season. Plants that have kind of become just as important to me as I've worked in urban parks are what I call workhorse plants. And they're kind of the unsung heroes, the sturdy plants that maybe don't get offered, often admired for their looks, but they add a slash of green most of the year and they're hardy enough to withstand the demands of park visitors. And I think particularly in this time when so many of us um, are going to whatever patch of green might be closest to us and parks are playing such an important role as gathering spaces and places of protest, these plants are really showing their value. Um, in this particular image, we're kind of looking towards the Chess Plaza, towards McDougal, you see in the foreground some grasses or, he or sedges, um, and then some hostas. Um, and these, in this case, we have some um, ferns in the background and some liriope or grasses in the foreground. And these all provide a really sturdy background. They can withstand maybe an overzealous toddler, um, and because they're perennials, they'll return year after year, even if they get a, a bit of a workout. And even last week, as I was just admiring the drifts of astilbe and the echinacea and the nepeta in full flower, I was still really drawn to the increase in these drifts of green. And I think from looking at some of the conservancy images, a number of these were planted by volunteers in 2019, and they're really showing off now. So I, for me, I just noticed this massive increase in these kind of workhorse plants that um, no longer are you seeing, um, you know, from five or 10 years ago, patches of, you know, exposed dirt in some of these sections, but they're really filling in with this wonderful variety of greens. And 
Um, there are too many to kind of point out, but one that I wanted to mention um, and one that I've kind of developed a new appreciation for and one we've included in the last round of the garden guide was the Akuba. And it's, you know, it's one that you've probably walked past. I certainly have in gardens and maybe not really paid attention to. Here we are looking kind of near the dog run, I believe. Um, but if you have walked around any perimeter of the park, you've passed this plant. It's evergreen, it's sturdy, it has these wonderful leaves with little dashes and swirls of yellow and white. And it really is one of those, again, workhorse plants that really provides a backdrop to many of the other um, blooms that will come and go throughout the seasons in the park. And so this was a very mad and quick dash through everything that is really growing right now um, in the park. And I hope that just even this quick little view has given you a sense of what's blooming now, maybe introduced you to a new flower. Um, I'm hoping that we can all make it back to the park soon to mingle with the bees and the birds and the butterflies. But in the meantime, I'm so glad that the work of the gardeners, the maintenance workers, the staffs, the volunteers, the donors are keeping this public space really beautiful for us. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Grace so we can field some questions. If there are any, again, I'm happy to go back to some of the slide images and answer questions about the plant guides we've worked on and maybe some of the plants we've covered in this quick chat. I'm not gonna be able to claim to identify every plant in the park. Guy would be the person for that, but I'm happy to chat if anybody has questions. Yes, and um, we can always, if you have questions that Susan can't answer or isn't comfortable giving the answer <laughs> for, um, we are happy to follow up with the gardening staff and get the accurate answer from them for you. Um, we are in communication with them. So thank you for that, Susan. Really wonderful. Um, it's beautiful to see all of these up close. We do have a couple of great questions. I'm going to start off with one about the comb flowers. Sure. Do only come in that purple color? No, there are a variety. This is the particular um, purpurea variety, but they do come in other colors. Okay, um, and another great question is, can we expect to see these plants every year or are they going to change? So um, there has been um, a shift. I think certainly Guy talked about this in his talk and some of the conservancy materials that there is a real focus on perennials and natives that will return every year. So um, in the instance of the echinacea or the coneflower, they're going to spread and naturalize. Nepeta does this a little bit. So you're going to see these um, year after year. Um, of course, gardens always adapt and change. Um, that's the wonderful and challenging thing about nature is you can't always control. It's a good lesson in patience. Um, and as our weather patterns change, there might be new things that are introduced and things that maybe move around in the park. But these are mostly um, yeah. plants that will mm -hmm. come back. That's yep. kind of the, um, That's the point. For those who are in part of Guy, who are able to join Guy's lecture, um, that is a big part of what he talks about. Um, it's a big part of the sustainability of the park, too. Um, so it is something he considers very, very closely. Um, I've got another great question, of actually a bit about the bloom guide itself, which uh, we will be sending to all of you as a fun little bonus. Um, we've turned, we've got a spring uh, bloom guide for this. So I will send that around after the lecture is over. Um, but we have a question about how you actually uh, identify the plants that you use in the bloom guide. How do you confirm that they are, um, you know, to, to me, I can't tell the difference between a uh, nepeta and Russian sage without standing next to it and smelling. Right. Well, so it is one of the challenges because we're producing the bloom guide when 
basically none of these are even showing. So for the spring and summer one, this was something we were working on, I think in December. Um, so it's really um, looking, thankfully, at like last year to see what is planted and we know is coming back, talking with Guy and, you know, the staff to really understand have they planted something new for the season that is something that is going to be really interesting to visitors. And we try to include, I think, a mix of things that, you know, maybe people are going to be familiar with, like the coneflower, and then maybe things like the foxtail lily, which are relatively new and might catch someone's eye because it's quirky and a little bit unusual. Um, so try to have a mix of that. And then, like I said, um, I think the most recent guide, because it was spring, we included some flowering trees and things as well. So trying to have that mix and then things that are located throughout the park. So it's not just one bed that we're focused on. Yes, because there, uh, you know, some people do have a tendency to just stick to one area of the park, but there mm -hmm. are beautiful things growing in pretty much every single corner you go. So yeah. Um, okay, uh, we've got one more question, unless people are just sending a few more in, and that is, um, what is your favorite of these flowers? Oh. If you have one. I will, is... I will give you the out that Guy uh, refuses to choose a favorite. He is like a parent who doesn't want to claim a favorite child. It is uh, really difficult. I would agree because it really depends on the season. Um, I would say... The one that to me um, maybe holds a lot of significance that I've used so much is Nepeta. It's not, you know, exotic and crazy, but it has proven just so valuable in urban gardening. Um, it is such a tough plant. I've put it in some really difficult situations and it has forgiven me um, <laughs> multiple times and has grown despite um, you know, what we as city dwellers impose on plants. And it also is one that you can maybe overlook. You just see the big waft of it. But then when you really focus on it, it is so alive with bees and then butterflies. So I have a particular love of that one and it smells amazing. Yes. So. And uh, oh, we got one more question, which is those workhorse plants that yeah. you were referring to. Mm -hmm. How often do those, I mean, if they're getting a lot of abuse, do they need to get replanted every season or how long? What's kind of the lifespan of those? Sure. Well, the great thing, so when I was in um, the park on last Friday and there were people in the park socially distancing, also some protests going on. It was clear that, for instance, some of the hostas were getting a little un purely unintentional abuse. But some of these workhorse plants are planted at edges, and Guy has talked about this, for that very reason. They're, they're kind of a buffer to the more delicate plants. And even though they might get trampled this year, they're going to come back next year. They're perennials. So um, while certainly a lot of them were planted in 2019, I think that was really because there were large areas that had not yet been planted. And now these will continue to come back every year. So that's why they're kind of the workhorse. They're, they're just gonna come back next year, even if you really abuse them this year. Okay, and we've got a couple of questions about the uh, in the park, the bees and the butterflies. So I this is another area of expertise. Um, but are they, you know, how are they doing? Do they seem to be happy? And where do they live? We don't have, um, you know, some of the parks in the city have bee houses or bee hives that they've put in. That isn't something we currently have in Washington Square Park. Um, but is, you know, do, how did, do you know how they live? Um, that's a really good question. And I don't know if there, it'd be interesting to know what hives might be going on in buildings around the park. That might be kind of interesting to know if there are any rooftop I do know, hives. I do know there are some rooftop yeah. hives. Um, we had been working with uh, the Honey Bee Conservancy to do oh, some kid programming last season, just uh, educational about mm -hmm. pollinators. And they had told me that there are some hives that they've placed on rooftops around the park. Oh, that's great. I'm going to um, kind of go back to that one um, Napata image of the bees. I mean, 
I can't converse with bees, but I can tell you that when I was there on Friday, just they were everywhere. They were on the foxtail lily. They were, Vinepida was swarming with bees. Um, I did not yet see butterflies, but the bees were throughout the park. Um, and I think, again, this speaks to the Conservancy's efforts to really plant the park with these pollinator friendly plants throughout. So there's not just one zone for bees and butterflies, but you'll really hopefully be able to see them kind of throughout the park. So whether they're hanging out full time in the park or just traveling through, there's something to attract them. Okay, it looks like that was our last question. So okay. very good timing. Susan, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Um, and for everyone else, um, you know, we hope that you enjoyed this virtual tour of some of the spring blooms. Um, the entire team at Washington Square Park, uh, myself and Cheryl Woodruff included, um, have been working really hard to keep the park looking beautiful and do what we can virtually to help keep you connected there. Um, but if you would like to help us um, continue our work and to support this work and bring this type of content online, we would really appreciate it. Um, we rely on the support of our wonderful community. So I'm going to put a link in the chat now to where you can donate to the Conservancy. Um, and we just appreciate all of you and hope you are happy and healthy and doing as well as possible in these very bizarre times. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.